I might as well be going, change up. This is Bruce Bochy, and you're listening to The Ranger Report. The Ranger Report. Yeah, The Ranger Report. If you want the inside scoop, listen to The Ranger Report. Oh, here we go. This is the Ranger Report podcast. News, insights, predictions, interviews, and information about the World Series champion, Texas Rangers, from the major leagues to the minor leagues. And now, here are your hosts, Ben Dieter, Tyler Nielsen, and C.J. Berryman. Hey everybody, welcome to the Ranger Report podcast uh, brought to you on the Fans First Sports Network and part of Dallas Sports Nation. We're coming to you on the Preferred Health Solutions online studio and of course, as always, brought to you by Walton's, waltons.com, everything but the meat. Glad to be here. I am Ben Dieter. You can find me on what's formerly Twitter at bdieter 75 <laughs> You can find me at CJB underscore RR. I'm CJ Berryman on the X. And I am Tyler Nielsen, and I officially changed my X name. So you can find me at the Ranger Report Podcast. Nice. All right. And uh, <laughs> nice job. And uh, of course, our guest tonight is former Rangers beat writer, current athletic writer, Levi Weaver. Levi, how are you? I'm good. I refuse to call it by its new name. Uh, <laughs> it's it's hard, isn't Twitter. it? You can find me on Twitter at 32EFAS, uh, and it will always be Twitter to me. Yeah, I still say Twitter all the time, and I hear a lot of other people. So be careful, though, ban your account like they did Tyler. Yeah, they banned uh, me, Levi, because uh, I used to refer it to as another thing instead of the X. Just kind of think of the letter X. So <laughs> I will not be saying that word anymore. The porn site. So Are they going to yeah. cut me loose and release me from that? Prison? Oh yeah. no! <laughs> yeah, they, they 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 suspended my account, so that's yeah. why I had to. That's why I had to get a new one for calling it right. Twitter. For yeah, calling no, it or for calling side. it that, he called it a porn site. X rated porn because oh. I used to say X rated. You know, and gotcha. you gotcha. followed gotcha. up. Okay. Yeah, we were just being stupid. All right, CJ, it was all fun and games. CJ, go ahead with what you got to say, and then we'll get. Started. Uh, we still need some help with Tammy, my uh, comrade in arms that I served in the Air Force with. Um, She's needing that uh, small intestine implant, and um, we've been posting and tweeting Levi um, <laughs> the uh, information on on how to go into the GoFundMe and and give her some help because the VA is not. They're just. Uh, it, <clears throat> I talked to her today. She's in high spirits, but um, everything's a process. Um, we need to help pay for them to get there because she's going to obviously have special needs when she travels because yeah. she can't dangle her feet. She can't, I mean, and this, this is somebody that's close and personal, but one of my best friends when I was, when I was serving our country and, oh. and she, she served our country very, very well as well. Um, so um, just uh, we'll repost that with, uh, with this uh, podcast and, and just keep her in your prayers and, and help what you can. Thank you very yeah, much. It's on our Twitter and Facebook right now. If you guys want to donate, the GoFundMe is there. So thank you guys very much. All right, let's get started with non-serious stuff. Now, Levi, you stopped doing the beat for the Rangers and they won the World Series. So what did you what did you think about that? <laughs> yeah, I was uh, you know what? I for a minute I was I thought that, that I was the curse, and then I realized that they had never won a World Series. And yeah. in my first year on the beat, they went to the playoffs. So then my my mind was like, okay, well then what was it? And I, I've settled on it was Tom Grief. Uh, he retired and then won the <laughs> It's not my fault. Uh, it's graceful. Uh, uh, no, I can say that. I love Tom, uh, and everybody loves Tom, so everybody knows that that's a joke. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that was pretty wild of them to just wait until you know I, I came off the beat, and then they finally do it. Um, now, fortunately, the the athletic took mercy on me and and sent me to Arizona anyway. So I that would have been just like an all time. <laughs> punch in the gut if they, you know, won the world series and I've been watching at home. So I was, I was very uh, fortunate 
not just that I'd be watching at home. It still would have been cool, but like watching at home after I sat in the press box for so many, like 13 to yeah. six losses. I like remember four. there was many, many nights and you're just like, dude, I'm so it's, it's October <laughs> and whatever yeah. you're tweeting, you're like, whatever I'm tweeting, just ignore it. I'm, I'm exhausted. Yep. We're all, we're all over it. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> September of 2021 and they've had 95 losses or whatever. It's like, just, <laughs> just end us, please. Uh, yeah, they, they, they pulled it off. And man, what a, what a, it's still a little bit surreal, I think for, uh, for myself anyway, but I think also you know, for a lot of fans just to be like, man, that feels kind of, kind of like a dream that they did it. They, they finally won their first world series after all the years of, you know, however long you've been watching the team, whether it's from that first year in 1972. And I know there are fans that have been doing that through, you know, I jumped on board watching them in the late eighties, but even fans that came on in the, you know, playoff years of the nineties or, or even became a fan when they made the world series the first time in 2010, that was still 13 years uh, yeah. before they mm-hmm. finally, finally pulled it off. So people have been waiting a, a long time and it's pretty cool. So I do have to uh, apologize for you on behalf of, Ma- of Matt Hicks and Hicksy. Uh, so when he, we had him on the podcast recently, he said there was only three people in the booth and he said, I forgot about Levi. He was the <laughs> one taking the video of, yeah. of the call and damn it. Levi is just so damn sneaky. Uh, he's like, he just shows up in the corner and is taking the video of Eric taking yeah. the, making the call. So how special is that to be, be a, a shadow in there and just sneaking that, sneaking that video out there. You know, I, so I had some, I had people ask me, you know, like, Oh, what was it like to finally see your team win the world series? And I'm like, it's not, you know, you, when you cover a team, and I don't know, I think some people think that this is not true, but it really is that like, it's your job to be objective. It is your job sometimes to say things that are critical uh, of, of a person that you talk to every day, right? And you see how the sausage is made and you get to know the the foibles of, you know, ownership or just, I, I think that the easiest way to put it is like, if you live and die with every win and loss, a couple of things are going to happen. One fans won't take you seriously because you'll sort start to look at it through the lens or you'll continue to look at it through the lens of a fan and be like, we, we can, we, we, first of all, big word to say, we, <laughs> we can still do this. We can pull it off. We, and people are like, you're, you're being delusional. So you don't really have any, uh, any credibility. Secondly, because you're there for all of the games or you're at very least, you know, there for most of them and watching all the rest, you would absolutely burn out if you, could keep caring about every game the way that you used to when you were a fan. And so it very quickly becomes a job. And um, so there was that, but I was like, I was sitting in the, in the press box for the first couple of games. And I'm like, what if they do this? You know, the team that when I was nine years old, I lived and died with Nolan Ryan and Julio Franco and Ruben Sierra yes, and you know, watched through all those Pudge Rodriguez and Juan Gonzalez years. And then, you know, Josh Hamilton and Michael Young and like, this whole, all I, all I wanted when I was a kid was for the Rangers to win the world series. And like, what if they do it and I can't enjoy it? Cause I'm just so like emotionally detached now because I'm doing this as a job. And I, I was, I promise I'm getting to a point here. Like I, I was like, I, I, I feel like a bull have robbed myself. I was like, yeah, it's cool. You're in the building. You're going to get to walk in and, but also you're not going to be like, it won't be special, you know? And then I finally had the idea to write the story about Nadell and, you know, I'm, I'm friends with Eric and, and that, you know, relationship obviously has changed from the time that I was a kid and he and Mark Holtz were the voice of Rangers baseball. But I kind of realized like, you know, if I had, if that, if somehow players didn't age and I was watching a team win the world series made up of Nolan Ryan and Bobby Witt and Kenny Rogers and, and uh, you know, even, even Colby Lewis to some extent. And like, all of those players, but, but really more the players that I'd watched when I was a little kid, if I was in the room watching them win a world series, Pete and Cavillia, uh, yeah, man, know, those guys, it, would, it, I think it would, Kevin still Brown. Be special to me. but, but you know, none of those players, Brian Downing, I mean, Browning that, Brian those, Downing. Yeah, yeah. I can play this. We can go on and on. <laughs> I could Jeff Houston you to death. Um, but none of those players play for the team. And in fact, none of the players that were with the team when I started, with the exception of Jose Leclerc and Martin Perez, were, were still with the team. Um, but for me to 
be able to go up, go in and, and film from behind Eric Nadell while he is finally getting to call that World Series win. It was like there was like that was my connection to my childhood. That was my connection to Fan Levi from those days. Yeah. And I did get that sense of like, holy crap, they did it. Like, <laughs> dude, how cool is this? But it was because of him. You know, it was because I got to see him make that call. And I talked, I had breakfast with him that morning and interviewed him for the story. And so from a baseball standpoint, yeah, there was this sort of objective or detached objectivity. Uh, you know, I had a job to do, but I did find my, my little thread to the special, like they finally did it moment. And it was absolutely through like being able to watch Eric make that call. I didn't even see the last pitch. I was so focused on watching him. I had to go back and watch the, the ninth inning later. Um, <laughs> It was, yeah, man. And thanks, thanks again to him. If he ever hears this, and I, and I have thanked him personally also, but just like for him to allow me to write a story about him in the middle of one of the most important weeks of his life and to like be in that booth and film and like watch that happen firsthand. That was uh that was an all time moment for me. Like I, I really don't think there's anything else in the baseball world that would ever you know, flip that same switch for me and, and be a special. They, they could never take it from you. They could never take it yeah. from you. Yeah. And I, I got to say, Levi, I agree with that. I started covering them. I do it part time. I started covering them last year and then this year as well. And I always thought I would never be at that place. But there are a couple of games this year that were, you know, blowouts. And I'm sitting in the mm -hmm. press box thinking, man, this needs to end. And as a fan, I never would have imagined, like I always stayed till the last out. I was always excited about it. Then I was like, oh, I got to mm -hmm. go down there to the press conference after this. And I got to go, you know, you're right. After a while it becomes routine and I don't even do it every mm -hmm. day. I just do it, you know, 12, 15 times a year. So it's pretty funny how quickly that turns. Once you start having to write and cover and talk to people and do all that, it's not quite the same as when you were a fan. <laughs> Yeah. And it's one of the coolest jobs in the world, but it's still a job, yeah. you know, and especially the being on the beat where you're there every day, like yeah. people think well, you get to go to a baseball game for work. That's so cool. And like, it is, no, you're right. It is very cool. Also, I get to be, uh, I, get, I have to go to the ballpark at about two in the afternoon and there's about 45 minutes of just standing around waiting for the one guy to walk into the room that I want to talk to. And they don't want to talk to me. I'm a second class citizen in that room. And I, I get it. I understand. I'm not a player. I never will be, but we're just standing, you know, and then we go up and we're, then we got to work, 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 work. And then it's time for the game. And also at Globe Life Field, uh, we presume there's a game happening down there uh, where there's oxygen, but you know, we're in a space station, can't really see the game. So, you know, there's three hours up there and then it's, hurry 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 get down there get your get your quotes transcribe your quotes write your story send it to the editor wait for the editor to get back like it's it's work and um yeah that will absolutely it's a, just a different experience than hey kids it's a special day we're gonna go watch a baseball game in person yeah. and then you show up and you know it's a great time and there's nothing like yeah. going to a, a big league baseball game for sure but yeah just that's the trade-off yep tyler uh, yeah, Levi, I think you make a really good point, too. You know, you know, you're talking about growing up, you know, just being a fan and then all of a sudden it's professional. But, you know, as being friends with Nadell, you got to take one of the most iconic pitchers there is. If you really think about it, being in the booth when he made the call, because the Rangers have never won a World Series. And there you are. You're sitting in the presence of a Hall of Famer. And for that moment to sink in, like, I guarantee you probably get back to the hotel that night and let it all kind of. I don't know if he were still just riding the World Series win, but looking back on it, were you like, wow, I was in the booth when Nadell made the call for the World Series? Yeah. So when it happened, I was just, you have those moments in, in life where for good or bad, you you are you have heightened senses. Like everything right. is just kind of slow motion. I was just like, I remember thinking, like, I don't get another shot at getting this right make sure he's in focus, make sure that it's actually recording. Cause sometimes when I take video, I'll think I hit the button and then I'm like <laughs> done and I hit it and it starts recording, you know, like don't do that. Just, it was, it was very much like making sure I don't screw this up. Hiding in make the sure corners. I, nobody could see. <laughs> right. right. Make it well, yeah, it's like making sure your eyes are dotted and your T's are crossed. You know, right. I mean, it's like, this right. is the moment. 
Absolutely. And I don't want to, you know, there might be TV cameras on him. I don't want to be in that shot necessarily. I don't know that I can avoid it, but I want to be as small as possible. I don't want to get in his way if he stands up, you know, like I don't, I, I got to be quiet. If I trip over something while that's happening and all of a sudden I pull a microphone cord out of the wall, you know, like everything, I'm just like hyper, hyper aware. And then after the game, like as soon as it was done, I hit end on the rec- on the video and like I got to get down to the clubhouse because we got we got all this post game stuff to do right and there's going to be you know I'm wearing my like trashy clothes because I know they're going to get soaked. Um, so it's my first it's my first time to cover the last game of a World Series except for 2020, which we weren't allowed down there. Right, it was when the Dodgers were playing at Globe Life Field and we just stayed in the press box. So you've got all these national writers that are experienced at it and ho hum. This is normal for them. Jeff Passons there every year, you know. Um, and I'm like, just, you know, I've, I've been covering baseball for eight years, but I don't, I've never done this. And so I'm, you know, eyes wide open and what's next and where do we go? I'm going to make sure I don't get lost, finish all the post game stuff. And then, uh, I was actually staying with my brother and he lives almost an hour from the ballpark, but I still had to write a newsletter that night. And I had to write the Nate L story that night. So I still had 3,500, oh, 4,000 words. Yeah. You had, you had a busy writing. night ahead of you. So once that was all done, I drove an hour. I get to my brother's. It's already late. And I'm up. I was up until six in the morning. Just oh, try to get this done. Try to get this done. Um, the next morning I had a, an interview on NPR that I, that they'd asked me to do. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Uh, thought it was the local NPR station in Dallas. And no, I had friends from around the country be like, did we just hear you on NPR? I'm like, I think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I slept for like three hours, got up, did the NPR thing. Did my second round of edits uh, on the on the um, Nadell story, posted out the newsletter link, and then I had to I had to catch a flight. So I'm like immediately turn around, like I got to get out of here. Slam the laptop shut, throw everything in, get to the plane, hustle through air, airport security. I get on the plane. I'm you know flying, sleeping during the flight. Get in. I'm trying to get home. You know, I, I finally get in and I'm exhausted. I'm you know, wiped out, but. I, I think I think I had another newsletter the next night, if I'm not mistaken. I really don't remember. But basically, I just didn't stop for like 36, 40 hours after it was done to like take it in. And so a couple of nights later, I finally caught up on sleep. Um, and I I thought, you know, I haven't actually watched that ninth inning. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch that again. So I put on the uh I first of all I read Jason Stark's column on it, and that's when it sunk in. And I was like, I'm going to go back and watch that ninth inning again. So I went back and watched it again. And it was, you know, two, three days later when it finally sunk in. I'm like, huh, I always wonder what this moment would be like. And it was, you know, I was there, but I don't, but now I know what it was like, you know, three days later. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. We're going to take a short break. When we come back more with Levi Weaver on the Ranger Report podcast. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Ranger Report podcast on the Fans First Sports Network, and we're here with Levi Weaver. All right, Levi, there's a couple of big name free agents out there that still aren't signed: Jordan Montgomery, Blake Snell, and most of them are Scott Boris clients. But you know, everyone's just wondering. I know the TV money had a lot to do with the Rangers, but it's not just the Rangers. Why haven't these guys wound up somewhere with spring training already going? Yeah, um, a couple of couple of things. I think you know a lot of it's not just the Rangers. First of all, that are that are struggling with the TV money thing. And, and I guess let's answer that first, which real, I'll try to make it really brief and, and very surface level for anybody who doesn't know, but, but basically the Rangers had a contract with Bally sports through, I think it was supposed to be through 2030 Bally's undergoing bankruptcy. Basically they go, Hey, here's the deal. We can either cut you loose and terminate the contract due to bankruptcy or, and they didn't offer this until, you know, a couple, a couple of weeks ago, or we can give you a one-year deal at a discounted rate. I've heard it's around 15%, but nobody knows for sure. So, I, so the Rangers would get 85% of what they had been getting. Uh, a one-year deal at a discount, or you can just go find a new TV deal. And they're like, okay, well, it's you know February, so thanks for that. So they, <laughs> they took the one-year deal. But the problem with that is that like Jordan Montgomery is not going to sign a one-year contract. And neither, neither is Blake Snell. And so they got some temporary, temporary relief and were able to, you know, 
make their make their bills and their payments this year, but it doesn't give them any long term assurances, and so they don't really know what their financial standpoint is going to be in a year or or beyond. So I think that's why the Rangers haven't um, signed a, a big name free agent like Montgomery uh, or Snell, both of whom I think would fit great, especially with half of their rotation out until halfway through the season. With some of the other teams, it's a matter of like, who's a good fit and of the teams that would be a good fit, who has the budget to do it. And it's just, it's a weird, it's a weird off season that a lot of the teams that have the budget to do it, the rotations are kind of set or a lot of teams that really need a good starting pitcher, their budgets are not probably quite up to par with where uh, Montgomery and Snell are for Snell uh, for both. Maybe it might just be that the agents have miscalculated the market, but I, I just think it's a strange um, market where we are right now that just like it's, there's just a lot of teams that need <laughs> a lot of teams that need a starting pitcher and a few teams that can afford a starting pitcher. And they kind of just aren't the same teams. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna flip this over, and my two partners here, uh, they disagree with me. They, you know, they like Scott Boris, and he's going out there and trying to get the max deal for all of his agents, which he's always done, always done. Mm-hmm. However, this season, I believe he's pushed it a little too far beyond beyond the envelope because five of the top players who are still unsigned are his clients. Jordan Montgomery, you know, I mean, and, and Blake Snell, I mean, and all, so I think him telling them to hold out and setting a, a, a ridiculous, I, like you said, overestimated the market. And so right now their value, to be honest, as far as a long-term contract or even a short-term contract is going down because guess what? Whenever they get the deal signed, spring training started. It's going to take them a while to ramp up. That's diminishing their value. So, uh, what do you? I don't think it's. I don't think it's diminishing their value though, CJ. I think it's actually helping them. I think it's actually helping them out through this time because, you know, a team's going to be willing to pay up with some of these players, and Blake Snell's going to get his money regardless. I mean, there's going to be a team willing. I mean, you're going to have injuries in spring training, which you know, obviously, it's official. It's, It's started. You're going to have injuries and. Teams are going to dig deep into this thing and be like, hey, well, there's Blake Snell out there. There's Jordan Montgomery out there. But but how and, much money are they losing right now in waiting until somebody gets desperate? Well, it didn't mind if you it, well, it didn't none. matter if you Blake's signed with the none. Go ahead, Levi. Paid. Players don't get paid in spring training. They get they get paid once. No, I, I understand eventually. that, but I'm saying like when right. how is it hurting them by when they by the time they get ready to actually be ramped up and ready to go and you've missed two weeks of the season. Well, well, I, I mean, on... y'all go ahead, Tyler. No, I'm I'm just saying. I mean, it is, I mean, the, the bottom line is, uh, Snell's still going to get thirty million a year, regardless of the way you look at it. I mean, he's going to get his money, whether it's with the Seattle Mariners or, you know, a division rival or whoever. However, you want to look at, it, he's going to get his money, and so is Montgomery. And it's we 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 could pretty much squash the idea that Montgomery's coming back to Texas. See why came out and he said, "I don't see us adding," you know other additions to this team. Uh, I think he's happy with the way the, way the club looks right now. And he, he's not going to give the money up because he doesn't know that outlook for, for the few uh, next few years with this ballet deal. So I guess we can the just let Montgomery go. The other factor here also is that I don't know. It's February 17th. So we're like two days into spring training. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, <laughs> I mean, we'll see what happens. It could be that it turns into them missing two weeks of the season, but it's also not like these players are like sitting at home on the couch, like in handcuffs. No, I did, I did. You know, like they're throwing, they're getting themselves in yeah. shape. So they'll be, they'll be ready for opening day unless there's an injury. But I think the two, the two factors for me anyway, that I, that I look at, if you know, trying to figure out the angle here, First of all, Scott Boris is very good at what he does. Um, he is smarter than I am about this. And so this is me sort of observing and, and guessing. Um, but I think if he feels like if he cracks now and goes, all right, we'll take the lesser deal because the market's all messed up with the TV deals and all that, like, fine, we'll take it. This sets a precedent. Uh, likewise, if he holds out for top dollar, as he's always done, that sets a precedent. It makes future negotiations easier because teams know he's just he's not going to crack. Like, he just doesn't. 
that's his thing. He he takes on the best players so that he can get top dollar. He's he's just at the top of the game. That's how it goes. Um, and I to Tyler's point, you know, there will be injuries, and so yeah, it's a little bit of a gamble. You know, one of those guys might have to take a pillow deal, um, and reestablish their value next year when the TV market is ideally, hopefully, fingers crossed, a little bit more stable. <laughs> yeah, it's it's possible. But if that's the case, then they're going to ask for more and a more per per year in a one year deal than they would Make get in a yeah. in a six year deal. You know, yeah. so the players are probably going to be fine. Yeah. You run some injury risk, you blow out your elbow in the halfway through a one year deal. And then, then you're in trouble. Um, but Hey, look, man, the, the market's weird right now. These teams, we don't have good matchups. You want to take a one year deal and make about five or 6 million extra this year. Let's try it again next year. And we've seen that. We've seen that work for good. It worked great for Adrian Beltre. You know, it, yeah. it does work for, for players, no, but I, I think it's more just, about, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's more about not setting a bad precedent if you're Boris and especially this early in spring training where this is the the time when we start to see, I mean, was it Kyle Bradish just had a, a UCL yep. sprain with, with the Orioles. Yep. We're going to see more of those. They're, they're going always... to try to, yeah. And they're going to try to do injections and stuff. But I mean, sure. if you have a UCL tear, I mean, it's at the rottings on the wall. So they're, they're, t- they're, their window right there to diagnose and get that figured out right now is it's, it's coming, pr- coming up pretty quick, the deadline on yeah. that, to, so that he'll be ready for next year. So that's another thing. I mean, yeah, you go out there, you you sign your – you wait, you wait, you wait. You sign your big league deal. You sign your huge deal, which they've been waiting on their whole lives for, that they've mm-hmm. earned and, and waited for, and then they go out there and blow a UCL. You know? That's that's I mean, there's I, there's two sides of the coin. So I, I yeah. completely understand, Ben. I completely understand what Tyler's saying. And I I didn't think about it the way you were saying is like Scott Boris has always set this precedent and he can't crack from it. Yep. Not even yep. when this these are weird ass times. Yep. He cannot yeah. crack. So it's 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 a good argument to have, good conversation to have, and I'm I'm glad I'm glad we had it. All right. Let's shift a little bit before we wrap it up with Levi and uh, ask since you were there, well, you weren't there actually when they signed him, but everyone wants to know, do you think Wyatt Langford makes this team out of spring training? Ooh, good question. Good question. We, we, this, this is another, this is another top topic. With our, <laughs> Tyler yeah. thinks he is. I think there's no way. Not yet. Um, I will say like the, the incentives that they've given teams now in, in the new CBA, where if your guy, uh, you know, wins, what was the, I, I wish I had the, I wish I had it right in front of me, but basically you get a draft pick if your guy finishes in the top, whatever of rookie of the year. And, you know, they're, they're incentivizing teams not to hold guys back. So, so I think if he is, I I'm very excited to see what happens once the spring training games start and you can't really, I, I made this mistake uh, a, a few years in, when I was early on in, in covering the team. I've seen a guy just light it up in spring training and being like, Oh, he's definitely going to make the team. And then the manager has to remind me the next day, like who did he hit that pitch off of? Uh, I don't remember. Did. Okay. The name was, do you, do you know that name? (laughs) No. (laughs) Okay. He was in single a last year. It was the seventh inning. They ran out of their normal pitchers. You probably didn't know his name because his name wasn't on the back of his Jersey because he was there just in case. So like, calm down you know <laughs> so it's going to depend on who he's hitting against also it's going to depend on like did that guy look like he had his good stuff was it his first outing was he was out there just establishing the strike zone or working on you know hey i i picked up a change up this this winter and i'm just throwing all change ups and the batters know the change up is coming i might as well be going change up and throwing it because you know everybody <laughs> knows or cutter, There's so many different or cutter, cutter over the off season here it comes with yep. it like so 80 percent of the time so it's a lot of factors and I, I just say that to say like if langford comes out and hits 500 for the first half of cactus league everybody's going to be like he's got to make the team it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to make yeah. the team where that where those determinations are going to be made is how does this how does his swing look how's his defense how does you know how does how's his approach in those at bats did he go up there like hacking it like looking for a first 
pitch fastball or was he patient? Did he recognize the off speed stuff? Well, did he swing at pitches outside the zone or was his zone command good? Like all of these different things that the hitting coaches are looking at, the boat he's looking at the front office is looking at a guy can go over five and give himself a better chance of making the team. If he had five very good at bats, then I got it that went up there, you know, searching for first pitch fastballs to ambush them and hit three home runs. What does that really tell us? Just, yeah, you're a professional. Yeah, kind of like, kind of like Nathaniel Lowe a few years ago when he didn't swing at anything. He didn't during swing spring at training jack shit. So he could see the most pitches he could see during spring training. Yes, that's that's yep. a prime example. So I won't know just by watching him if he's going to make the team. Uh, you know, hearing evaluators talk about him and scouts, it really seems like he's got a lot of upside. Um, I think it'll all just depend on what they see in those at bats, and we off, we don't often hear about that until probably a little bit later in the spring. Yeah. Right, Sorry. Guys, I know that's else? a long answer. No, that's all right. That, 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 but was, and I will bring up one thing. We got a couple minutes. Uh, people <clears throat> seem to forget and forgot about Ezekiel Duran and what he is capable of bringing to the team. Cause when Corey Seager got hurt, Ezekiel Duran turned his game up big time. And so why do you think he's not being discussed as being the DH kind of super utility Michael Young guy because he can play all the out the infield positions? Well, CJ, CJ, I'm going to interrupt real quick because you make a really good point about Duran now with this injury with uh, Josh Young. You know, we don't know if he tore his calf muscle. I don't know if y'all seen the video, but it does not look good. No. And no, I know he was set to grade. have an MRI today. Low grade strain. Go ahead. Low grade strain. Okay. Two, three weeks. Yeah. Two, three weeks. Oh, was it? Okay. So I didn't, yeah. I didn't hear that. But it, still, I mean, he, he's not going to be. I mean, he, you've got an injury like that. You've got to put rest on there, but you have Duran that could play third base and can fill in that spot for a couple weeks. You know, don't rush Josh Young back. Um, just well, like Corey Seager, don't rush him back. Right. Corey Seager also had uh, surgery for a sports hernia. So maybe we can just get two Ezekiel brands. <laughs> there you go spring. all right guys what else we have for levi i think i think i think we've 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 pegged him enough and he's he's tired and he's still <laughs> bed i was i don't think he's going to bed at, at this time of night but <laughs> levi hey we always appreciate it man thank you very much of course yeah good to talk to you guys thank you levi. Uh, third, third, third time third time with us I think Thank so. Yeah. I'm losing track. Have fun when you yeah. get to Arizona. Sorry. I won't be there. Yeah. Kind of. That's all right. <laughs> hey, appreciate it. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're glad, but we're glad to go. Too, we're so. we're going right. to have a blast and you're going to have a blast not being there. So <laughs> great. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. <laughs> Everybody wins. All right. All right. That's Levi Weaver from the athletic Levi. Thanks a lot. All right. We'll see you. Thanks. Leave. See you. Thanks for listening to the Ranger report podcast. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, and at therangerreport.com.